So, uh, good evening. My name is Shelley Sweeney. I'm the head of Archives and Special Collections here at the University of Manitoba. Today's uh, lecture is uh, inside uh, the Archives Reading Room. On behalf of the University of Manitoba Archives and Special Collections, the Slavic Collection, and the Department of Germanic and Slavic Studies, I'd like to welcome you all to our 21st annual J.B. Brunitsky Distinguished Lecture with our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Alexander Motel. The J.B. Rudnitsky Lecture was established in 1994 through the generosity of an endowment fund established by the first head of the University of Manitoba's Department of Slavic Studies, Dr. Yaroslav Rudnitsky. Each year, the, the J.B. Rudnitsky Distinguished Lecture brings to Winnipeg an internationally acknowledged scholar to speak on a topic of interest to those pursuing East European and or Slavic studies. The lecture is jointly sponsored by the University of Manitoba Archives and Special Collections, the Elizabeth Dayfo Library's Slavic Collection, and the Department of Germanic and Slavic Studies. I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize the 20 years of dedicated service that Vladimir Zvonik, of the Slavic collection of Elizabeth Dayfo Library and a valued member of Archives and Special Collections has provided to the Runitsky Lecture. She has taken minutes, made all the arrangements for travel, uh, made arrangements for technical support, food for the reception, and many more details. In many years, Vladimir would go with James Kamenowski to pick up the speakers holding a sign with their name. We owe a huge debt of gratitude for her exemplary work. Would you please join me in thanking Vladimir Zvonik. The reason why we're acknowledging her is she is retiring and she has had a smile on her face. <laughs> it's really got, kind of getting depressing. <laughs> Because she's just like, oh, I'm retiring. <laughs> and you guys are all staying behind. <laughs> so now, without further ado, I will let my colleague, Dr. Miroslav Shkandri of the Department of Germanic and Slavic Studies, introduce this evening's speaker. Alexander Motel is a professor of political science at Rutgers University in Newark, but he's also a writer and, believe it or not, a painter. He has been a associate director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University, and he specializes on, in Ukraine, Russia, the USSR, nationalism, revolutions, and empires. He's got several books, some of which you may know if you're students of East European history, Imperial Ends, The Decay, Collapse, and Revival of Empires, another book, Revolutions, Nations, and Empires, Third book, Dilemmas of Independence, Ukraine After Totalitarianism. Uh, an earlier book of his uh, was entitled, Will the Non-Russians Rebel? And one of the first books that uh, I became acquainted with is The Turn to the Right. This is one of the first and still uh, a very important book on uh, Ukrainian nationalism, the, especially the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. So. Uh, uh, Professor Motel is well uh, uh, equipped to bring us information on uh, internal events in, uh, the, in uh, Ukraine, but also on the whole sphere of uh, Eastern Europe and the politics of, of Russia. Pr Professor Motel's novels include a recent one called Whiskey Priest. He's got a book uh, called Who Killed And Andre Warhol? <laughs> He's got another book uh, called The Jew Who Was U a Ukrainian, and right now he's working on uh, a, a, a work called My Orchidea. He's also a poet, he's published uh, poets, poetry in uh, various places, and he has done performances of his fiction in uh, New York and in various clubs. His artwork has been shown in solo and group shows in New York, Philadelphia, and Toronto. But perhaps best known, he is perhaps best known to many of you because of his blog on world affairs, which is always insightful, concise, and considered. 
this blog has proven very important guidance to many who follow events. Professor Motegi has a rare talent for responding quickly and intelligently to rapidly developing events. The Maidan, uh, a civil rights protest movement that turned into a revolution is now due to Russia's invasion of the Crimea and the massing of troops on Russia's borders with Ukraine turned into an international political crisis. The gravest one since the end of the Cold War. President Putin has called into question the entire post-Second World War order, the inviolability of borders, the value of treaties, of international guarantees, and agreements. His invasion of the Crimea has united almost the entire, entire Euro-Atlantic community against him. In fact, the entire world. There's now talk of isolating Russia by excluding it from meetings of the G7, by instituting economic sanctions, by freezing accounts of Russian leaders abroad. And in general, uh, it has overturned uh, all our conceptions of what uh, uh, a normal, peaceful world should be. It's generally less recognized that the consequences for Russia will be even greater censorship, more restrictions on free assembly and speech, increased repression of opposition politicians. This process has already begun. Yesterday, access was banned to various websites, political websites, oppositionist websites in Russia. The largest radio station was shut down. Um, Alexei Navalny's blog, uh, an important opposition politician, was shut down. And Dorsch, the leading uh, oppositionist TV station, announced that because of the clampdowns, it would be ending uh, its broadcast in a couple of months. We're in a much more dangerous uh, world, especially in the last few days. What are Putin's motives? What can the world expect next? Will subsequent events bring an end to Putin's corrupt regime? in the same way as violence ended Yanukovych's rule in Ukraine? Is there a way out of this political crisis? And what can Ukraine expect in the next weeks? Ironically, it appears that Putin's invasion of the Crimea has united Ukrainian society. But Mr. Yanukovych still remains a card that President Putin can play. Uh, and I'm sure all of us are thinking uh, right now, will there be an invasion of mainland Ukraine? Things have moved so quickly in the last few days that uh, the title of this, uh, of this talk could be changed. Uh, but certainly, uh, the question is, will Ukraine survive the post Yanukovych crisis? We're sure that our distinguished guest speaker can help us understand some of the dramatic events of the last weeks and some of the important implications uh, in the issues involved. Please welcome Alexander Muti. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I was here in October, um, and it was a pleasure, and it's a pleasure to be here again. Then I was here thanks to Mrs. Kotcher. And the last time I had been here was back in 1973 or 74, so it was a period. Miroslav made a very good point, and thank you, by the way, for the kind in introduction about the title of the talk. Uh, when I was asked to provide it, I think it was back in January, I thought, well, Will Ukraine survive Yanukovych? That sounds pretty good. And then eventually, then around towards the end of February, I thought, well, I should call this, will Yanukovych survive Ukraine? And then, of course, unfortunately, nowadays, the more appropriate title would be, will Ukraine survive Putin? Um, as you can imagine, writing this hasn't been a piece of cake. So what I've decided to do <clears throat> is adopt somewhat of an eclectic approach, um, and I trust and hope you'll find it of interest. Ladies and gentlemen, so I have never experienced war, and I suspect most of you haven't either, or the threat of annihilation. But now, thanks to the internet, I, like thousands of other American Ukrainians and Ukrainian Canadians, 
I'm living at the edge of an existential abyss. The violence, the war that threatens Ukraine with destruction, with destruction, does not threaten me, it does not threaten you. I'm in New York, and Ukraine is thousands of miles away, but war will threaten my friends and colleagues and family in Ukraine. I, like thousands of other Ukrainian Canadians and Ukrainian Americans, must now live with the very real possibility that their lives could be extinguished if Vladimir Putin chooses to do so. Indeed, Ukraine could even disappear as a state if he chooses to make it disappear. The internet has inserted the reality and possibility of mass death into our lives. We watch events unfold in real time, and we watch these events unfold all day, every day. There is no respite. There is no pause. Ukrainians in Ukraine must live with the tangible threat of physical annihilation. We must live with the tangible, with the virtual threat of physical annihilation. Their fears, of course, are more palpable. The consequences for them of war and violence are real, real destruction and real death. The consequences for us are virtual. We are witnesses to tragedy and mass killings. We watch, our eyes glued to our computer screens, and we imagine the horror. Our empathy is not abstract. Our friends, colleagues, and relatives are real people. Neither is our feeling of impotence abstract. It gnaws at our spiritual insides and reminds us that we too are dying, albeit spiritually. Many Ukrainians in Ukraine now believe that a Russian invasion of mainland Ukraine is inevitable. If it happens, war will break out and thousands will probably die. Putin's former economic advisor, Andrei Ilarionov, claims Russian armies will march on Kiev and behind, beyond. Putin's ideological mentor, Alexander Dugin, insists that Russians' goals are all of Europe. Meanwhile, Russian troops and tanks are amassed on Ukraine's borders. Terrified realists that we have all become, we naturally expect the worst but they will soon be attacking a country that dared to say no to Putin. As the clouds of a massive land war appear to approach Ukraine, we watch our screens with horror and hope against hope that Russian bombs will not fall on our friends, colleagues, and family in Ukraine and virtually on us. Ladies and gentlemen, it is fitting that the Euro revolution in Ukraine should have begun on the 80th anniversary of the Holodomor. Ukraine's greatest tragedy in the 20th century set the stage for its greatest triumph in the 21st. One of the main components of that triumph is the self-empowerment of a nation that had been brutalized by two world wars and the dehumanizing experience of seven decades of communist totalitarianism and Russian imperialism. According to a study of the Moscow-based Institute of Demography, Ukraine suffered close to 15 million excess deaths between 1914 and 1948. Consider the numbers, 1.3 million during World War II, World War I, 2.3 million during the Civil War, the Polish-Soviet War, and the famine of the early 1920s, 4.0 million during the Holodomor, 300,000 during the Great Terror and the repressions in Western Ukraine, 6.5 million during World War II, and 400,000 during the post-war famine, and the destruction of the Ukrainian National Liberation Movement. Of this total number, some six million are attributable to communist totalitarianism and Russian imperialism, 
or roughly half of all their victims in the Soviet Union. And Ukraine's population was never more than about 20-25%. Let's just hope and pray that their number is not supplemented by the 21st century version of Adolf Hitler, Vladimir Putin. It is equally fitting that we should be remembering Ukrainians' greatest tragedy and greatest triumph on the 200th anniversary of Taras Shuchenko's birth. Ukraine's greatest poet reminds us that the struggle for freedom is part of the human condition and that Ukrainians, like all human beings, want to be free. Permit me to read four translations of his poems that I made throughout this talk. I think you'll find them appropriate to the mood. I start with the Ukrainian as Minai Dni Minai Nochi, Days Go By and Nights Go By. Days go by and nights go by and summer's end. Leaves turn yellow, leaves turn dry. My eyes are dead. My thoughts are asleep. My heart doesn't beat and all things sleep. And I'm wondering, am I alive or barely living or just wandering? If only I could laugh or even cry. Tell me, fate, where are you? Have I none? If you can't spare a good one, Lord, then how about a bad one? Just don't let me sleepwalk and lose my heart and roll through life like a rotten log. Let me live. Let my heart live. Let me love. And if not, to hell with the world. It's bad enough to be in chains and die a slave. But it's worse to sleep and sleep in freedom and to fall asleep forever without leaving a trace. Did you live? Did you die? Who cares? Tell me, fate, where are you? I have none. If you can't spare a good one, Lord, then how about a bad one? When Ukraine attained independence in 1991, it inherited the state apparatus of the former Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. The administrative organizations that had been appropriate for a Soviet colony were completely inappropriate for, a, for an independent state. Government ministries and agencies were functionally undefined. Chains of command were absent, informal or inadequate. And the quality and quantity of government personnel was shockingly low. Foreign advisors suggested that Ukraine should pursue radical economic reform, but most Ukrainian elites were correct to believe that fundamental change first required building a modern state. After all, a functioning state is the precondition of rule of law, democracy, and a market economy. Laws are meaningless without an effective state apparatus to adopt and implement them. Democratic procedures are about the organization of the state and its relationship to civil society. And the market, in order to be a genuine site of economic exchange, presupposes some regulatory agency that establishes and enforces the rules of the game. No less important, the physical security of a country necessitates an administrative apparatus able to maintain law and order within the country and a security apparatus able to ward off threats from outside the country. Ukraine's successes with respect to state building were impressive. Unfortunately, though not accidentally, state building also assumed pathological forms. When the state becomes institutionally and numerically bloated, its efficiency and effectiveness decline. Lines of command become blurred, elites engaged in localized empire building, resources are diverted from their intended uses, and state employees 
engage in bribe-taking and corruption. The state apparatus then becomes an obstacle to the goals it ostensibly wants to achieve, democracy, rule of law, a market economy, and security. States become bloated, weak, and parasitical in two sets of circumstances. First, when social, political, economic, and cultural institutions are generally weak, state building often becomes the preponderant policy concern of, of elites and runs ahead of other institutions. Second, in newly independent countries with weak economies, the staffing of states frequently becomes a source of political patronage for elites. When, as in post-communist circumstances, both conditions come together, you have the worst of all possible world, and the temptation to let state building develop pathologically can become irresistible. Post-Soviet Ukraine proved no exception to this rule. It needed to build a state for reform to be possible. But state building, in the absence of reform, guaranteed that the state would become the primary obstacle to reform. A dilemma, if there ever was one. Let me read another poem from Shuchemko. Sonce zachobit hore chugniyut. As the sun sets and hills grow dark, as the bird song ends and fields fall silent, as the people laugh and take their rest, I watch. My heart hurries to the twilight gardens of Ukraine, and I hurry. Oh, how I hurry with my thoughts as my heart yearns for rest. As the fields grow dark, as the groves grow dark, as the hills grow dark, I see a star, and I weep. Hey. You star, have you reached Ukraine? Do dark eyes scour the blue sky for you, or don't they care? May they sleep if they don't. May they know nothing of my fate. When state building is pathological, the group with most coherence, most discipline, and most resources is most able to capture the state and force it to do its bidding. In Ukraine, that group proved to be the Party of Regions, which formed an alliance with organized crime and the oligarchs of the Donbass. The Regionaires had no vision for the country other than plunder and self-enrichment. But they had the disciplined cadre, they had a criminal esprit de corps, and they had fabulous resources. Their first attempt to capture Ukraine failed as a result of the 2004 Orange Revolution. Their second assault in the presidential elections that catapulted Viktor Yanukovych to power in 2010 succeeded. Yanukovych quickly accumulated vast powers, thereby transforming the presidency into a dictatorial office while subordinating the other two branches of government, the Rada and the courts, to himself and his party. He proved to be a quintessential extremist, committed to destroying the existing order as rapidly and as thoroughly as possible. As Yanukovych became the focus of increasingly personalized rule, his closest confidants joined him in plundering the country. The logical endpoint of this development was reached in 2012, the triumph of Yanukovych and his so-called family. The reduction of the Rada and the courts to meaninglessness and buffoonery and the transformation, the complete transformation of the party of regions into little more than an instrument of systematic rapine. Ukraine fell victim to the Yanukovych ruin. 
Yanukovych created a political system that resembled a hub and spokes, with him at the center and almost all key political appointees directly responsible to him. I've called this a sultanistic regime. Such a regime is and was intrinsically brittle and unstable. Sooner or later, sultanism had to collapse under its own dead weight for a number of reasons. First, sultanism could work in a medieval setting with a primitive peasant economy and an illiterate society, but it is incompatible with both a modern economy and society, which can be governed only with flexible and effective institutions and it is also incompatible with an increasingly globalized world within which the free flow of information defines effective government. Second, sultanism is dysfunctional precisely because Yanukovych's vassals, or vassals in general, are unwilling to employ individual initiative without the patron's approval. As a result, decision-making inexorably moves up the ladder and the decision-making capacity of the sultan becomes overloaded. Third, because clients of the sultan compete with one another for the patron's favor, they start to compartmentalize. They refuse to cooperate. They desist from providing the patron with accurate information, thereby undermining even more his capacity to make decisions. Fourth, such, such regimes are by definition always highly corrupt, and corruption transforms the bureaucrats who run the state into self-interested cogs with ultimately no loyalty even to the sultan. There were two specific conditions that were typical of sultanism in Ukraine. A sultanistic regime might be able to survive for a certain period of time if the sultan were a philosopher king in Plato's sense of the term. Needless to say, Yanukovych was no philosopher king. Sultanism also flourishes best where society is weak, passive, apathetic, but the condition of Ukrainian society was quite the opposite. The Orange Revolution and the five years of the Yushchenko presidency produced a vigorous and increasingly assertive civil society that insisted on democracy and, very importantly, on human dignity. Recall the slogans from the time of the Orange Revolution. Recall the slogans from the time of the Euro Revolution. The emphasis was always on our being people, human beings who deserve to be treated as human beings. And I'm reminded of the placards that African Americans wore in Birmingham in 1953, which simply said, I am a human being, I am a man. In sum, a weak regime confronted a strong civil society for the period from early 2010, when Yanukovych was elected, to late 2013. When Yanukovych turned his back on the association agreement with the European Union, he pushed popular discontent over the edge. The important thing to remember is the discontent was there. It was latent and it was active. Ukrainian society was like a spring. All it needed was a spark, if you like. That's a mixed metaphor, but I think you get the point. As a result, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians took to the streets, initiating the mass movement that eventually culminated in the collapse of the mafia regime on February 21st, 2015. Let me read another poem by Shochenko. This is also entitled in Ukrainian, Oi Hlyanuya Podivlyusya. If only I could see my fields and steppes again, 
Won't the good Lord let me in my old age be free? I'd go to Ukraine. I'd go back home. There they'd greet me, glad to see the old man. There I'd rest. I'd pray to God. There I'd... But why go on? There will be nothing. How am I to live in slavery with no hope? Do tell me, please, lest I go crazy. The sudden, rapid, and comprehensive collapse of the criminal Yanukovych regime surprised many, especially after the butchery that just preceded it, but it was pre-programmed by the nature of the regime. Lacking an ideological raison d'etre and resting only on the willingness of security forces to sustain it, the brittle regime crumbled. Once Yanukovych ordered mass killings, the democratic revolutionaries in Kiev refused to be cowed, provincial uprisings swept the country, and the, and the regionaires, his base, realized that their careers, their livelihoods, and possibly their lives were on the line. In sum, theft, plunder, and rapine proved to be insufficient to keep a criminal mafia regime intact. If post-revolutionary Ukraine emerges intact from the ongoing crisis with Russia, it stands a good chance of moving in the direction of post-communist Poland, the Baltic states, and their Central European neighbors. In effect, Ukraine is now at the same point they were in 1989-1991. Like them, today's Ukraine has a dysfunctional state, a malfunctioning economy, and a very vigorous civil society. Unlike Ukraine in 1991, Today's Ukraine does not have to create a state and market economy from scratch. There is actually something there to work with. Today's Ukraine can draw on the resources of the state and civil society to reform the economy and fix the state, fix itself. There is no reason to think that Ukraine's current elites cannot or would not or will not succeed in transforming Ukraine fundamentally if they have the opportunity to do so. At the same time, I do want to emphasize that it is also true that Ukraine is far worse off than the Central Europeans in 1989-1991. In addition to 70 years of communist totalitarianism and Russian Empire, Ukraine suffered incalculable damage to four years of untrammeled regionaire exploitation. The treasury is empty. Political institutions have been eviscerated. The economy is on the verge of collapse. Rule of law has disappeared, and the army, as you know, consists of about 6,000 battle-ready troops. And unlike 1991, when Russia was in retreat and was weak, Putin's Russia is much stronger, or so it seems, and in attack mode. Unfortunately, Ukraine's fate is now in the hands of Russia's Fuhrer. Back in the early 1990s, when the Russian chauvinist Vladimir Zhirinovsky first reared his loony head, analysts began discussing the Weimar-Russia scenario. A friend of mine and I, we even wrote a grant proposal and were rejected out of hand. According to the scenario, the chaos of the late Gorbachev period, the 1980s, would be followed by the emergence of a strong man a la Hitler, Zhirinovsky, who would impose order, consolidate the nation, and lead it to some imagined form of glory. The scenario didn't work for Zhirinovsky, but it proved 
quite true for subsequent developments in Russia. The chaotic period of Boris Yeltsin's presidency in the 1990s was remarkably similar to Weimar Germany in the 1920s. In both cases, imperial collapse, enormous economic hardship, and political humiliation were blamed on democracy and the Democrats. And Putin turned out to be Russia's version of the Fuhrer. Both he and Adolf Hitler came to power legally, developed cults of the personality, dismantled democracy, made the trains run on time, employed chauvinism and neo-imperialism to legitimize their rule, remilitarized their states and promised to make them great powers, and made it their mission to ingather their abandoned ethnic brethren in neighboring states. Putin, Russia, developed all the characteristics of a full-fledged fascist state. I want to emphasize this. Putin's Russia, as of about 2006, 2007, has all the defining characteristics of a fascist state. I'm not saying that, I'm not using the word fascism in the colloquial sense as shorthand for bad or someone I don't like. This is a system that is strikingly similar, if not indeed identical, to the systems that existed in Mussolini's Italy and Hitler's Germany. It is not authoritarian, it stopped being that somewhere in the middle part of the last decade. It has moved on. First, it moved on to become fascist toyed. It is now pretty much a full-fledged fascist state. And keep in mind what are the characteristics, the key characteristics of a fascist state. It's not just pure authoritarianism. We find that everywhere. It's an authoritarianism with a charismatic, strong man leader who utilizes neo-imperialism and hyper-nationalism as a way of reaching out to the population, bringing it to him, to his side, and thereby legitimating his rule. That should strike a bell as you're thinking about Putin, and it should also strike a bell when you think about Mussolini and Hitler. Putin's invasion of Ukraine fits this per picture all too neatly. Because of his aggression and because of his possible unpredictability, Ukraine now faces an existential question. It is at the edge of an existential abyss, unlike ours, which is virtual, imagined, psychological, spiritual, though nonetheless quite real. Ukraine literally stands at the edge of an existential abyss. And the question is, is the occupation of Crimea comparable to Hitler's annexation of German-inhabited Sudetenland? Or is it comparable to Hitler's attack on Poland? At that point, only half the country was annexed. Or is it comparable to Hitler's Anschluss of Austria? In the first case, Putin might go no further than Crimea. In the second case, he might settle for eastern Ukraine or southeastern Ukraine. In the third, he might actually try to occupy the entire country. Each scenario would be associated with varying degrees of violence and bloodshed. And to refer, return to the term I used at the very beginning, excess deaths. We don't know what Putin's intentions are. And if you ask me to elaborate on that later on, I can, but I can tell you right away, I don't know. He has declared the Kiev government to be illegitimate fascist, neo-Nazi, and anti-Semitic. He has denounced the 1994 Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances on the grounds that post-revolutionary Ukraine is a new state. 
He reserves to himself the right to intervene in Ukraine any time he believes that Russians and Ukrainians are threatened. I trust you listened to his interview, his press conference a few days ago. He says explicitly, we can begin a war in defense, not just of Russian citizens, but, quote, of Ukrainian citizens. Finally, he has said that he does not, quote, worry about war. He does not worry about war. And should it break out, intends to use Ukrainian women and children as a shield for Russian troops. Read the interview, it's terrifying. And read his body language as he's state making these very statements. It's even scarier than his statements. I submit to you this is not the language of your everyday statesman. Um, I don't know of any leader of any country in recent memory who speaks like this. Even the vilest dictator always claims to be supportive of peace. Of course, peace on his or her standards. Nevertheless, this is the kind of language that is simply unacceptable. This is the language of a dictator, possibly of a megalomaniacal dictator. This is frankly the language of Adolf Hitler. And frankly, I'm terrified. How far will Putin go? As I said, I don't know. No one knows. It's speculation. Let me suggest a number of possibilities. This is all that we can do. If he is truly mad, if he is truly incapable of rational thought, of weighing costs and benefits, of seeing into the future and weighing costs and benefits, all bets are off. And then, he, and then we may expect, as Dugin suggested, that Putin will be marching on Paris, because nothing will stop him. And there have been analysts in Russia and other places who suggest just that, that this is a man who's been completely swept up by this ideology, so much so that he sees nothing, he hears nothing um, other than the dictates of this ideology. Despite what I've just said about him, about his being Hitler, I do think that his recent behavior and his behavior over the last 14 years gives us grounds to suspect, to think, that he is capable of rationality, that he is capable of some measure of cost and benefits. He is capable of understanding causes and effects and the likelihood that certain behaviors will produce certain kinds of responses. I can go into that later on if you like. If that's the case, then there is hope. Obviously for Paris, but there's also hope for Lviv, Kyiv, and perhaps for points east of Kyiv. Because, of course, he would have to calculate what all of this means and what all of the negative consequences of his behavior might be for himself as well as for Russia. If this is true, and I don't know this to be true, but I, as I said, I'm happy to explicate on that later on, then it seems to me that a full-scale land war in all of Ukraine seems unlikely, not impossible, and I'd like to say it's impossible, but it strikes me as unlikely. Because, and primarily because, unlike the invasion of Crimea, an invasion of Ukraine, a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, would not be a quick and glorious little war. It would be complicated, it would be messy, it would be bloody, and it would have all sorts of untold consequences. Unfortunately, an attempt to pick off some vulnerable provinces, especially in the southeast, is less unlikely, or if you prefer, is likely. Um, 
Although, here too, the longer Moscow waits and the more Ukraine builds up its defenses, the more difficult and perhaps the less likely such an annexation will be. Most likely, perhaps even certain, is to my mind the more or less permanent occupation of Crimea. Things may change five or ten years ago, and I'll suggest at the end of my talk why they may change for the better, but for the foreseeable future, I for one don't see Crimea remaining officially, de facto that is to say, within the confines of Ukraine. What is equally certain is that whatever the outcome, Ukraine's and, Ukraine and Ukrainians, them and us, will have to learn to live on the edge permanently of an existential abyss. We have to live at least as long as Putin remains in power or possibly as long as a Putin-type fascist Russia exists with the threat of potential, with the potential threat of annihilation. Real for them, spiritual and virtual for us. It occurred to me this week as I was thinking about this that Ukraine has become Israel. And Ukrainians have become Jews. We are Vladimir Putin's Jews. And if that doesn't create bonds of solidarity between the two communities, I don't know what will. However, like Jews, certainly like my Jewish friends in New York, uh, who have a great sense of humor, who never give up, and who are committed to living their lives normally, regardless of whatever adversities they encounter, I do not despair, and I refuse to despair. Just as aggression brought down Hitler, so too the Crimean invasion, and possibly an additional annexation, will turn out to be the greatest strategic blunder of Putin's career. Indeed, it could even lead to the end of Putinism. And I'm saying this not just to end this talk on a happy note. I truly believe this. Uh, and the argument is somewhat similar to my Cassandra-like statements for over the last three, four years that Yanukovych is doomed. And that, at least in that regard, I was right. And please pray and hope that I'm right in this regard as well. If Putin knew his history any better, he'd know that nothing consolidates post-revolutionary regimes like invasions. Look at France. Some counter-revolutionaries always join the invaders, but most people put aside their differences and rally around the flag. The threat of existential annihilation strengthens post-revolutionary states, strengthens post-revolutionary armies, invigorates national identities, and encourages leaders to adopt radical change. They have to. There is no choice. For 24 years, Ukrainian elites had a choice to do something or to do nothing, which was significantly easier. They have no choice anymore. They have to do something. And the Ukrainian response to Putin's invasion, the Ukrainian response there as well as the Ukrainian response here in Canada and the United States, fits this bill to a T. East and West, Russian speakers and Ukrainian speakers, ethnic Russians, ethnic Jews, ethnic Crimean, Tatars, have discovered for the first time in many years, possibly for the first time in 70 or 80 years, that they actually have a common homeland, that they have something to lose. Even Ukraine's top oligarchs, all Russian speakers, have condemned the invasion and rejected partition. We'll see how they respond in the next few weeks. Nevertheless, that's important. Who would have thought, I certainly didn't, that Donetsk would be willing to fight for Ukraine? When the crisis ends, and of course it will end, Ukraine, whatever its shape 
and size. And that's the proviso here. We'll be stronger. I don't doubt that. Its diverse population should finally possess the features of a modern nation or be way, in, way along the way of developing the features of a modern nation. Ironically, it should be the case, I think it will be the case, that Putin will accomplish what Ukraine's elites have thus far failed to achieve, effective state building and genuine nation building. And that Ukrainian state and that Ukrainian nation will not regard him and probably not regard Russia and his hysterical warmongering supporters with affection. There is an additional irony here, if you like. Um, one could argue that it was Lenin who established the first Soviet Ukrainian state. It was Stalin who unified the Ukrainian territories. Khrushchev who added Crimea to the mix. Gorbachev created the conditions for Ukrainian independence. And if things work out well at the end of the day, Putin may actually succeed in creating a real state and a real nation. As you know, Putin's naked aggression has also outraged the international community, and in particular the United States, Canada, and the European Union. In this respect, the Weimar scenario does not fortunately hold. The democracies have not responded to Putin's aggression with Munich-like appeasement. The West has extended impressive financial and diplomatic support to Ukraine while making it clear that Russia is a rogue state. Putin essentially is a pariah leader and Russia is a rogue state. Ukraine will eventually join the West and thus the world. In contrast, ordinary Russians will suffer even as Putin persuades them that his chest beating is an adequate substitute for a good life in the modern world. Although some two-thirds of Russians currently support Putin, that number will drop if and when body bags arrive in Moscow and the stagnant Russian economy creaks under the burden of military adventurism and prolonged occupation. Wars and occupations are expensive, especially for states with stagnant economies and declining reserves of energy generated easy money. How will, Rus <coughs> Excuse me. How will Russians react? By <coughs> How will Russians react? By happily dying for a dictator or by taking to the streets? How will Russian elites react? By supporting an irresponsible fascist leader or by jumping ship? Fact of the matter is that imperial overreach in the absence of a strong economic base almost always leads to imperial collapse. And Putin's nascent empire is likely to be next. So Ukraine will survive. That's the good news. It may be smaller, and it may only be smaller temporarily, because if and when the empire collapses, there may be a return to the fold. But Ukraine will survive. Russia and Putin may not survive. Russia probably will. Putin almost certainly will not. And the only question is, and this is the tragic question, is how many people will have to suffer before Russia's Hitler suffers Yanukovych's fate? How many excess deaths will Putin cause and Ukraine, as well as Russia, have to endure for the sake of his megalomaniac dreams and plans. Let me end 
on a hopeful note with another poem from Shochenko, and this, of course, you know, Zapovit or Testament. When I die, let me rest, let me lie amidst Ukraine's broad steppes. Let me see the endless fields and steep slopes I hold so dear. Let me hear the Dnipro's great roar. And when the blood of Ukraine's foes flows into the blue waters of the sea, that's when I'll forget the fields and hills and leave it all and pray to God. Until then, I know no God. So bury me, rise up and break your chains. Water your freedom with the blood of oppressors. And then remember me with gentle whispers and kind words in the great family of the newly free. Slava Ukraini. And in the spirit of Jewish-Ukrainian cooperation, Lechaim. Yes, I mean, the question is, uh, will Putin go into Lithuania? Uh, well, Lithuania, probably not. There is a very small Russian minority, and it would require an, a real leap of the imagination for him to claim that he's going in to defend Lithuanians or Poles. The Poles are a larger minority in Lithuania, especially since the country is doing quite well. A more real threat if one is talking about the Baltic states, is Lest Estonia and Latvia, and especially Estonia. Uh, Latvians, Russians tend to be concentrated primarily in Riga. Uh, Estonians, Russians, who are about 35 or so percent of the population, so that's even more than Ukraine. In Ukraine, it's only about 19, 20, 21, thereabouts. Uh, they're all concentrated in the northeast on the border with Russia. And even though life for Russians in Estonia is actually quite good, they're in the EU, they can travel to Paris, there are certain restrictions on their voting. So they can vote in local elections, they cannot vote, well, many can, but many cannot, in presidential and national elections. And Russia has been insisting that this is a crude violation of their civil rights. Estonia justifies this on the basis of their having settled in, in Estonia after its illegal annexation by the Soviet Union in 1939-1945. So Putin could go in and say, my brethren are asking for my support, and it's my obligation as a Democrat, as a constitutionalist, as a supporter of human rights, to correct all these wrongs. Estonia, by the way, has reacted very critically and very negatively to the annexation of Crimea. They understand that this is an immediate threat to them. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, there was a piece in Foreign Affairs, the article that suggested Ukraine should double down and have referenda in the eastern oblasts to say, all right, vote now, and then we will see what the implications are after you spend on that idea. This is an article I did for foreign policy, by the way. It came out one or two days ago. Um, it's on Facebook. But if you look on foreign policy, put my name and you'll get it. Um, and the idea, which I've been actually playing with for about five or 10 years, is very simple. And it rests on two things, fear and a strategic calculation. Fear that the Russians can come in and essentially take what they want and a strategic calculation that now is the time for Ukraine to hold referenda in Kharkiv, Luhansk, the oblasts, the provinces, Kharkiv, Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, Kherson, 
uh, Mykolaiv, Odessa, and perhaps even in Crimea, under UN auspices with blue uh, helmet troops, all that sort of thing. In other words, they would hold the referenda. They would determine the procedures. There would be international observers and all that. And the populations would have an opportunity to express their desires. Do you stay or do you want to go? Are you in or are you out? If you're out, I'll give a deck to you. If you're in, you're not leaving again. You're in to stay. All right, so if you're in, you're in to stay in this Ukraine, and if you don't like it, go. That sounds like a risky proposition. And here's the, here's the Hitri Malaros kind of angle. Um, you may have seen in a public opinion survey that was conducted by the Democratic Initiatives and the Kiev International Institute of Sociology, both very respected institutions. They conducted the referendum in mid-February and revealed that in Kharkiv and Odessa, the sentiment for unification with Russia, that was the question, was about 20%. In Crimea, by the way, only 41%. In Luhansk, it was, 20, it was 33, uh, Donetsk, 30, uh, 28, or vice versa, I forget. And then Mykolaiv, Kherson, uh, and Zaporizhia was about 5 to 10. In essence, it's a no-lose proposition, unless suddenly everybody has decided to join Russia. But the idea behind this would be is that you give people, and especially the international community, you let the community see that we're organizing a referendum, you force the Russians to agree to this. How can they not? They insist that everybody wants to join. So you have a referendum. You hold the referendum, all right, under, again, as I said, international auspices. My bet is that everybody would stay. On the other hand, if 50 to 60 percent of a population really wants to join Russia, then it's probably not defensible. You probably can't hold on to it. Um, I mean, whether you think of this as a fifth column or something else, but the point is you're, ha you're talking about two-thirds of an oblast that really thinks that Kyiv and its democratic and Western-oriented plans are fundamentally wrong. So in a way, you'd be separating the wheat from the chaff. But the bottom line of all of this is, is that it would give Ukraine's claims to Ukraine international legitimacy. It would show the world that, hey, we're ready, we're not afraid to ask people if they want to stay or leave. And as I said, I do think they would stay, but if 60% chose to leave, Budilaska. And of course, remember, one of the original, the first uh, fear, the I mean, first motive for this was fear. So this is obviously intended to preempt an invasion or an occupation or an annexation. Uh, madam. In the in what scenario, um, uh, how far uh, the USA can go in helping Ukraine uh, military? I know the, the, the states need to have, uh, don't, don't like to sacrifice their people, but military or the, the arms, whatever. Well, no, well, there's been talk. Um, yeah, oh, sure. Is, uh, how to tell us about the behavior of this traditional government, if it's doing right, going so so. So long waiting, so long with those military people in, in Crimea, leaving them just like the zoo, whatever they say. Yeah. Good question. Well, with regard to the United States, I mean, it's obviously a question mark. I mean, they're, they're not providing military assistance now, but that's not the kind of thing the U.S. would do. But if there is a significant aggression, um, well, again, if Russian troops just march into Luhansk, march into Donetsk, and people greet them with salt and, and, and bread, there will not be military assistance. If there is significant opposition on the part of whatever Ukrainian forces, and or if Putin continues driving westward, my guess is that the, that the United States would, be support, would support providing some kind of defensive weapons. Um, those might be surface-to-air missiles, anti-tank uh, weapons of various kinds. Uh, that would possibly happen. I think, I think there's a good bet that would happen. Um, of course, one could say it's a little too late. Uh, obviously, one would prefer to see some kind of cordon sanitaire being constructed now. Um, 
but that's just the way these things work in international relations. One always responds a little too late, uh, for better or for worse. As to the Ukrainian government, I'm, you know, personally, I remember <laughs> the Radas took power exactly two weeks ago. Uh, then they had to change the constitution in order to do things legally, blah, blah, blah. Then, so then finally it was Thursday, uh, roughly one week after Yanukovych's downfall, that we finally have a government. They published this magnificent plan of action. And then Friday, the, uh, the invasion occurs, right? Um, so has it done well, uh, given, you know, all things considered, the fact that they replaced virtually every governor, that they're embarking on various reforms of ministries, uh, that they've reached out to the West and have actually gotten an enormous amount of support from the West, uh, that they're trying to m make the army and the military and the National Guard a little more functional, that they're trying to establish controls on the eastern borders, you know, more or less successfully. And this is all with militia and internal troops whose loyalty may be a little shaky, so you're not really sure, especially the guys in the east, whether they will stop those Russian extremists from coming in or whether they'll simply say, Pajalsta, right? So, you know, given all those complexities, I'm impressed. Um, given the fact that Ukrainian troops in Crimea were so totally outnumbered, um, I mean, I think this is the right strategy. I mean, to show, I mean, you know, the fact that they've resisted nonviolently, which is not what armies generally do, has cast, has done two things. One is it works extremely well in the international community. People say, oh, all these Ukrainians, they're terrific, right? Uh, excuse me, three things. Two, the second thing is it didn't give Putin the pretext that he was looking for. Because, of course, once we start shooting first, then, of course, he simply comes in and he's defending um, poor Russians from Ukrainian aggression. Um, and then there was a third thing that I forgot. <laughs> um, but in any case, uh, so my sense is that actually made sense. Um, oh, oh and by, and of course, they would lose. That's the other point. They would simply lose. And so you would, you would lose all your forces. Uh, you would lose all the, uh, the, the, the logistical supplies and things of that sort. So it's better simply to maintain them where they are. Uh, Ukraine was in a no-win position. The question now is what happens after this referendum? Because as soon as it takes place and they declare independence and so on and so forth, they will declare Ukrainian troops as an occupying force. And of course it's not, and the legalities will be on our side. Nevertheless, they will declare Ukrainian troops as an occupying force and therefore feel justified that they might be able to employ violence as well. Oh, yeah. okay. I got a question, and it's about something that I haven't heard about or read. Uh, because Ukraine now is more unified than ever, as you said, and there is an interim government now, only an, an interim government, and Putin and Lavrov saying they will recognize the interim government. And the earlier, early elections are scheduled in May. Why doesn't the interim government call a snap election? And if Yanukovych wants to come back, allow him back and call a snap election and show the world a real democracy under siege. Yeah. Well, I mean, two responses. One, I think, is pragmatic. Namely, um, there are 220,000 Russian troops arranged along Ukraine's eastern, northern, and southern borders, something like 500 tanks, 300 fighter planes. Um, so there's a, th you know, there's a sense that, well, annihilation is, per is perhaps approaching. And under those kinds of conditions, Generally, governments tend to coalesce, they tend to focus on the security issues and because that's the priority. I mean, survival is the precondition of anything else. So, and remember, an election costs money, you've got to organize it. If it's supposed to be done according to the books, constitutionally, you need a campaign period, you need to register everybody and so on and so forth. 
So that just complicates things enormously. Right, well, well, again, remember, if you bracket the Russian invasion, first of all, the May elections would obviously take place. At this point, we don't even know if there will be a Ukraine in May. I mean, I, I'm being very, I don't quite mean that, but I'm trying to make a point. Uh, if there is at least a hint of a possibility that the country might not exist, why worry about elections? What you're worrying about is the 220,000 troops. I would worry in, in exactly the same fashion. The other point, remember, elections would work well with the West. But the West is on board. The West recognizes this government. I don't believe for a second that fair and free elections would persuade Putin or, des or, or, re or desist him from doing whatever it is that he wants to do. If he wants to march, he'll march with Yanukovych and Tao, with Yanukovych and Kiev. It doesn't really matter. Uh, remember, I mean, he's using bogus arguments regarding constitutionalism. He's using bogus arguments regarding legalities and human rights. This is a man who has persistently, systematically, consistently violated the Russian constitution for 14 years. This is a man who's dismantled every human and civic right in Russia. This is a man who's dismantled democracy. For Ukraine to play the game is obviously important, but it's important for its own sense of well-being and it's for its own identity. It won't persuade him. Sir. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, okay, how about, well, how about three questions, but you ask them, and then I'll respond to all of them. So how about one, and then two and then and then we'll take someone from the back okay from here uh, from the lady over here okay is that all right yeah, that's good. okay and then if you just ask your questions and I'll try to respond okay uh, a non-ukrainian friend of mine asked the question to me is maybe in the short term is Ukraine better off without Ukraine what's your thought okay. all right is Ukraine better off in the short term without Crimea Yes, uh, um, uh, madam, I'm sorry. With, uh, sorry. With the uh, Ukraine in crisis, what about Russia with its Caucasus, Central Asian republics, and the, even the Tatarid have, uh, have uh, notified of her jihad? And then maybe uh, Ukraine, the present government, could ask for EU right now? EU? Yeah. Okay, and then perhaps the final question. Uh, there's been whisperings um, in media that uh, this, that which has been kind of playing this for the longest time, that Euromaidan kind of got in the way of all of that. Uh, I wanted to speak to that maybe. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, very quickly. Would like to do something. And I want to ask you, even this, is this recorded? I have dozens of friends I'd love to give this to. But what can we do? Every single person in this room wants to do something. We are frustrated. Please, tell us what you've heard. OK, wow. Uh, let me start with the last, well the, well, the penultimate question, which was about. Right, 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 right. Uh, I mean, the, Ilarionov and a number of other Russian analysts have suggested that this plot began, that Putin has been planning some kind of aggression since mid-2013. Now, how do they know? I don't know. Do they know? I don't know. If it's true, then the question becomes, well, I mean, was this just some sort of, you know, remember pentagons and ministries like that, they're always planning. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's in the works. But if it was in the works, then that may mean that he was expecting Yanukovych to sign the association agreement and thereby take a chunk of Ukraine as a kind of punishment for Yanukovych. Um, that's one possibility. Other people have said, you know, this has been something that was improvised in the aftermath of the Euro revolution, which is also possible. We just don't know, right? We just don't know. Um, now, mind you, if it was planned in 2013, 
then the idea that Putin is a madman who is out of control becomes significantly less persuasive because this is something that he alone would not have been planning. He's planning this with his advisors, the military staff, and they presumably had some kind of goal in mind. There may be a glint of good news in that, in the sense that we'd probably prefer a sane Putin to an insane Putin. Uh, better off without the Crimea. You know, if you look at the population of Crimea, 55% roughly are Russian, roughly 20, 24 are Ukrainian, and about 15, give or take, probably 15, 16 are Crimean Tatar, and then another, another five, six are other. These Russians came there primarily, but not exclusively, after World War II. These were primarily, though not exclusively, war veterans. So you're talking about a hyper-nationalist, hyper-chauvinist population. Not all of them, of course, but very many of them. Um, and these are people who are probably irreconcilable. Um, my guess is that one can talk to many people, you know, Russians in Luhansk, Donetsk, Kharkiv, and others, Odessa, Minashi in some sense of the term, these people are fundamentally settlers. They're like, in some ways, the people who came into Estonia. Would Ukraine be better off without them? Probably yes. Probably <laughs> yes. Uh, would Ukraine be better off without Crimea? Well, it depends, right? Uh, if Crimea is supposed to be a hotbed of radicalism, jihad, and Russian you know, terrorism, then yeah, it's better off, go, leave. If it were to be what it was over the last 20 years, which is to say a kind of crummy version of the Riviera with, <laughs> you know, with a disgruntled Crimean Tatar population, and, you know, then it's okay, then it could stay. Given what it's become over the last two weeks, um, losing Crimea may not be such a loss. I mean, I actually wrote a piece, then that's the title that the editors developed. Um, it may not be such a loss. Um, Ukraine will go on. Ukraine will do perfectly well. My fear is in Crimea, frankly. Uh, if, if that would stop, again, I don't want to use the word appeasement, but given all these characteristics of Crimea, um, Putin, you want it, go ahead and take it. I'm worried about the southeast of Ukraine. I'm worried about Kiev. I'm worried about Lviv. As unlikely as I think a full-scale war will be, I'm still very worried about it because a 5% chance is roughly 5% too much, all right? So I'm worried. And any existential threat is too much of an existential threat. Um, Crimea, on the other hand, is not. One of the things to keep in mind if you're looking for sources of schadenfreude is if Crimea, I mean, if and when Crimea becomes some kind of statelet or part of Russia, its tourist industry will go through the floor. Um, its economy is likely to collapse, and within five or so years, people in Crimea may be longing for the good old days of Ukrainian mismanagement in Kiev, which <laughs> left everything alone, and, you know, it was crummy, but it was okay. Uh, the, very good question about the implications for Russia. Um, in invading a territory and annexing a population because it consists of Russians and Russian speakers or Russian citizens, Russia has created a very dangerous precedent for itself and for its relations with the countries of the near abroad. So for st starters, let me start with the second point first. Uh, as you know, Putin has been dreaming of the customs union, the Eurasian Union, and all that. And the only two countries that have always signed up were Belarus and, Northern, and Kazakhstan. It is very significant that neither Lukashenko nor, Kaz nor Nazarbayev, the president of these places, has endorsed the Crimean invasion. They've been silent. And again, be for a very simple reason. It's like Estonia, but they're not in NATO and they're not in the EU. From their point of view, what Putin is saying is that they could be next. 
All right, something like 30, 25, 30 percent of the Belarusian population is Russian, and they tend to be in the east. Most, if not all, of northern Kazakhstan consists of Russians and Russian speakers. And that is especially vulnerable because all of the Kazakhs are in the south, and they're separated by steppe and desert in between. So it's even easier to invade than the Kherson, the Pavizha, or something like that. You just have to take it. And it would take the Kazakhs 10 days to cross the desert before they actually come to it. I'm exaggerating, but the point is it's a big country. So they're terrified. And what Putin has essentially done is he's killed any notions, any plans, any schemes for some kind of larger kind of Russian-led union. After this, why would you want to join? It's crazy. I mean, they may join for kind of pro forma reasons, but it won't be significant and won't be important. Internally, as you probably know, Russia has some 10 to 15 autonomous republics, plus a whole bunch of subdivisions within those that happen to correlate with non-Russian nationalities. I mean, there are the Chechens, there are the English, the Ossetians, the Dagestanis, which we hear about, of course, because they're in the North Caucasus and they've been actively engaged in either terrorism or national liberation, depending on your viewpoint. But they have the Tatars in Tatarstan, they've got the, Uyg uh, the Uyghurs, they've got the Yakuts, they've got many other nationalities, many of whom are in the east and along the borders with China, Kazakhstan, and other places. If Putin has the right to protect his own and to separate chunks and declare independence, why not the Chechens? Why not the Dagestanis? Why not the Uyghurs? Why not the Yakuts? Why not the Tatars? And so on. Many of these regions actually have very significant deposits of mineral resources. Yakutia is the primary source of diamonds. Tatarstan has a lot of oil. Um, they could cause significant trouble. And you should expect something like this to happen. I mean, not immediately, but it will begin to happen, especially as the Putin state, on the one hand, starts cracking down in the manner that Noslav suggested. So it's going to squeeze everybody. And then at some point, it will start loosening. It will become equally brittle, similar to Yanukovych's regime. And at that point, you can imagine those various nationalities will start rearing their heads. Joining the EU, Highly unlikely, but the association agreement is presumably going to happen within the next few weeks. Um, and that's obviously a very positive step forward. What to do? I write a lot. And I would encourage all of you, whether you do this professionally or not, to consider that as well. Um, we need to affect the discourse, to use that academic term. Uh, we need to make sure in letters to the editor, in occasional op-eds, in longer pieces, that the, the public opinion, and especially the media more generally, are on our side. We need to clarify mistaken notions it's very important to emphasize over and over again that Ukraine, and especially the government, does not consist of fascist, neo-Nazis, and anti-Semites. That can be done, as I said, in letters to the editor. One is nice, a hundred would be better. Uh, Op-eds, opinion pieces, those sorts of things make some kind of difference. They're not going to change the prime minister's policy overnight, but they create an atmosphere. They force people or encourage people to think in terms of what possibilities are, of, what, of how to look at Ukraine, how to understand it. And for, of course, as you know, for many North Americans, Ukraine is still a bit of a cipher. It's not clear what it is and what it means. These coming weeks will be especially critical I mean, if Russia does nothing, then, you know, we can all go home and watch Jimmy Fallon or something. Um, but if, if the worst or worst case scenarios take place, it will be very important to explain to the public what is going on. 
Um, and we can make a difference. I mean, Canada was one of the first to adopt sanctions. Canada was one of the first to adopt tougher language. The United States was probably second. Uh, those things matter. What strikes me as someone who writes too many of these things um, is that there are far too few of us who write op-eds. Um, there are tons of newspapers, magazines, websites that are read by thousands upon thousands of people that accept op-ed submissions. Don't send it to the New York Times your chances, my chances, anyone's chances of getting accepted are about one out of a thousand. But you can send it to serious journals like Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, McLean's, or whatever, right? There are these sorts of journals, and they do influence policymakers. And writing these pieces is not that hard. It just requires sitting down and doing it, and you may have to go through a number of drafts. Um, as I said, I'm struck by the fact that in terms of the sort of op-ed production, there are probably no more than about five people who do this in English. When you consider the number of Ukrainian intellectuals, the number of, well, Ukrainian-Canadian, Ukrainian-American, and so on, right? Uh, consider the number of professors and others, or just educated people who know how to write. And that number, then of course, depending on how you define it, that expands from a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand, possibly to tens of thousands. There's no reason why it should only be two or three or four people. Timothy Snyder, who has no Ukrainian connection, probably writes more than any of us. Thank God for Timothy Snyder. But where are our Timothy Snyders? That's, point, that's, that's very important. Um, and we can do this by affecting the media in general. So it's not just writing. I mean, there are radio. There's radio. There's television. There are ways in which we can affect these sorts of things. And they do have an impact, ultimately, on creating impressions, creating moods, creating alternatives, framing issues, if you like. And then, of course, things like badgering your uh, representatives, whether it's in the parliament or in the Congress, uh, you know, never letting them forget that this is an important issue, that it matters to the constituents, and that they're not going to vote for him or her <coughs> if they neglect us. That's important, too. Um, and then, of course, last but not least, um, money matters, uh, but there are those channels, you know about them. Ukraine will need money, um, you know, uh, whether it's the families of the dead, those who were killed, whether it's the families of perhaps future excess dead uh, or injured, and of course there are very many of those, um, and regardless of which scenario eventually plays out, um, if, as I believe, there will be a Ukraine, and if, as I believe, there will be a strong or stronger Ukraine that will survive, we can then make a very important contribution to that Ukraine, um, whether it's in terms of money or personnel or the kind of support that we uh, can give simply by attending lectures such as this. All those things matter. Last point, it's important to emphasize over and over again. Ah, let me make this point, uh, before, and then I'll stop. I promise to stop. Uh, but it's important, it's important to emphasize who the real fascist is, all right? Um, if, if you're not sure how to frame that in sort of academic terms, I've got a whole bunch of articles. Uh, some of them are on the web and so on, and you can use the language. But it's important to emphasize that Putin is the fascist. Putin, Russia, is a fascist state. It is. I'm not, again, as I said, I'm not just saying that, but it is. And we're not, and Ukraine is not. There may be a couple of crazy fascists running around is obviously the case, but that doesn't make it a fascist state. It's not a neo-Nazi state. It's not an anti-Semitic state. And all these, uh, those statements by the chief rabbi of Kiev, the open letter by those Jewish activists, we've got to push that everywhere we possibly can so that people understand who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. And it's clear that we're the good guys. And we can't let them in Moscow twist that discourse, twist the images in such a way that people start talking about fascists in Kiev. Well, good God, maybe they deserve this. We've got to forestall any possibility of that. We have to present ourselves as the Democrats because we are. We're the aggrieved because we are. 
or they are, even more so than we are, of course. Um, but the point is, we're the ones who deserve the support of the world, whether it's economic or military, diplomatic, or for that matter, just moral. Sorry for going on and on. Thank you very much. of Manitoba and uh, obviously a very uh, spirited audience. Uh, I'd like to thank our, our speaker. Um, he's given us a lot to think about and frankly uh, I know that all of us will be watching what goes on uh, particularly uh, after the, uh, the, the so-called uh, referendum on uh, it's Monday, I think. Sunday. Sunday. On Sunday. So, um, so thank you again. Um, I don't want to cut off all uh, access. Uh, we're going to have a um, buffet here uh, if you want to help yourself uh, with it for uh, stay for the reception and uh, and um, perhaps maybe follow up some comments or questions with our speaker. Um, and then uh, we'd be you know we'll continue to the discussion. So thanks again and. Uh, and we'll be watching what goes on. <laughs> Thank you.